Just a quick disclaimer, this product is unofficial and not from Minecraft or approved by Minecraft. But even so, a fun project to make. So as you can see, his face is a 64 pixel LED matrix, and this is a Grove RGB matrix. And it's actually controlled by an Arduino Nano Every, and this actually sits in the back of his head. All the joints are connected by magnets, so there's no screws or anything else between them. So you can be reconfigured however you wish. And these are neonidium magnets, or near-earth magnets, that are really strong. So I designed this in CAD on a Libra design, and I've actually saved all these files as STL files in binary format and ASCII format. So if you wanted to, you can go and print these on a 3D printer, and you'll find the link to these files on my website and in the description below. So this is how I'm gonna machine it out on the CNC machine, just from one plate of aluminium. And this plate of aluminium costs around about 12 pounds. So I've set it up in this way, so it's the most efficient way of doing it. So firstly, I need to put all the G-code into the Arduino. And this is an Arduino Mega 2560 that controls the Miller machine. So from the drawing, I take all the measurements, work out the movement of the Miller machine in basic G-code, and that is move from point A to point B at a set speed. So it's a bit of a daunting project to make, but I wanted to see if my converted CNC machine was up to the challenge. Plus I enjoyed making this gift for my nephew. I'll put a list of timings and titles in the description too. So if you wanted to skip to a certain point, you can go directly to what you want to see. First, I need to make a reference edge. So when I flip the plate over to do the reverse side, I know that everything's going to be lined up top to bottom. So this is a square end stop that I made a while back and it actually makes the task of squaring up the work a lot quicker. So these are the holes for mounting this to the table where I wasn't originally going to use hex bolts and a thin bit of aluminium underneath the main plate but as I tightened it all down the top plate started to bow. But later on I decided to attach the plate directly to the table just using a couple of bolts. I wasn't going to machine down to full depth in any case. Now to find the edges to set the machine up to zero. So set up the Y axis first, then the X axis. And that's a four millimeter lower shaft on the edge finder. So by moving the machine by two millimeters in the X plane and two millimeters in the Y plane, and then zero in both X and Y, the machine's set to the datum point. And that's the datum point of the plate, not the parts. And that will come in handy when I have to flip the plate later. Oh, and it's much better for the drawbar and the bearings if you actually remove the Morse taper like this, rather than loosening and then bashing the top of the drawbar. So this machine's got about 150mm of travel front to back in the Y axis and around 300mm in the X axis. And this part actually uses the full range of motion of this machine. Although the table is a 400 mil table, but with this 40 mil shell cutter, it makes sense because it goes 20 millimeters over each edge, effectively 340 millimeters of cutting distance. Plus you need some space for the end stop and the bolts for the part. So it's good to have a wide table. So to test the large amount of G-code that I put in earlier, the ideal thing was to put a pen in the collet and then test on paper to see what the pattern looks like. and then to see if it all fits on the plate. Once that's done, you can put the plate back on the machine and then set it up for the dating point.
and there's two datum points. So that's the datum point of the plate and then the datum point of the parts, which is a little bit further in. But as you can see, the septic tank air pump, which is a diaphragm pump and very quiet, is very effective in getting those chips away. Well, there is another video of that on my channel and I'll put the link in the description. I'll also put all the links to the tools in the description as well. So this is a chamfer mill that I'm going to run over all the edges and it will do it in one pass. So that means it will save a fair amount of time. I also wanted to see if the chamfer mill would cut out the pixel feature. Although as you can see, it didn't cut it, it actually ripped through the material. So my next thought was a one millimeter milling bit. So just touching it off initially so I know where the top surface is and then machine it all at one millimeter or so I thought. And this is the actual speed that it was moving at. So quite slow, but I've sped it up so you can see what happened. So instead of using that, um, looking around at what else I had. So I wanted to know how well a center drill or spot drill copes with milling channels and it actually worked really well. So I'd highly recommend using a center drill as a milling bit, and it could do it in one pass, which again was another time saver. The reason for cutting this feature down is so that the legs can actually sit backwards and forwards and the magnets will still reach the center. Otherwise there wasn't enough power for the magnets to hold. These spot drills are fantastic and I will use it later on as a chamfer mill. The good thing about a CNC program is you can go to each hole location with one tool, then change that tool over and then go to the locations again and use that next tool, which is a good time saver. So just before drilling all these holes, I'll set up the quill stop just to make sure that I'm not going to drill into the table. And then once I flip the part and machine off the back surface, the hole should actually appear. Then it's a case of count the bore in each hole so the bolt sits flat. And 
and then it's countersinking all those holes just to make the edges nice and round and smooth so there's no sharp edges. So flipping the plate over just need to set up that dating point again so now the dating point is the top left side of the plate and the other is at the top left of the parts. So this was a test pattern just to make sure it's all going to machine out properly. And I did that a number of times and you can see the touch off points as well and also modified the code to go back across some of the parts so the wall features of each one was nice and smooth. So it's just a case of cutting all these pockets out, this to make the parts lighter so the magnets had a better chance of sticking everything together and not just falling apart all over the place. So the lower part of his legs were not machined out to give him a little bit more stability. And look at all them chips that are building up in the back. That air pump is really doing its work. So these are the magnet slots, and that's a three millimeter tungsten carbide end mill that served me really well over the last five or six years. And they're not that expensive either. And these take magnets that are 10 millimeters in diameter and five millimeters in depth. I don't know if you can tell from this angle, but the slots in the arms are actually a little bit longer and that's so the arms can actually move up and down. Otherwise, when you turn the arms, it'll interfere with where the head is. And as you can see at the moment, it's a manual Z axis, but this is something I'm addressing later on this year. And I'm having to manually move the Z axis down for each pass. Again, this is setting up the quill stop to get the correct depth of the threaded holes. And then peck drilling to break off the chips. Because I used a 6mm end mill to mill out these pockets, I decided to use an oversized tool to chamfer the edges down. And this worked okay for the first pocket, although for the subsequent pockets, because the part wasn't held down the center, it was actually making the part vibrate and causing uneven edges. So I wanted to see if the spot drill did it. This is because it had a, a more of a cute angle and the lobe wasn't pushed down into the part, but to the sides, so it greatly reduced the chatter on the chamfer features.
and the edges are chamfered like this so you don't get any sharp burrs. Next it was cutting the M3 thread, and that's easier while it's on the table. And I only use the third M3 tap to give it a better thread. The M chips are really starting to build up now. So this was the fun bit, where well, it was okay to start with, but obviously started to jump up and down because it's only held at each end. And I used the feeler gauge in the middle just to stop it bouncing up and down in the centre. So because of the amount of movement, and as you can see it's starting to look like tinfoil, I had to hold down either side of the of where it was cutting with some sort of wooden tool so if it did actually catch uh, it would just take the wood out of my hand but once that was all done I was quite happy with how it all came apart it was still fairly strong although you could just rip each part off of the plate There's a wheel, there's a way. Cool. Got a bracelet. It's really light. So that is the whole body machined out and the two parts will screw together like this. So obviously there's a little bit more work to do and also to get that pixel feature on the side. So now I hope you can appreciate how much time a 3D printer saves you, although I still haven't got one yet. So it's just a case of setting up and taking off the back feature and then making sure each part is actually 11 millimeters in depth. So the whole body is 22 millimeters from front to back. And that's just so the center pixel actually covers the seam in the two parts. So there you have the main torso and you can see where the magnets locate, where there's a nice little space in the centre, possibly for a battery or some other electronics. To make sure the legs and the arms were exactly the same height, I machined them at the same time. So back to that spot drill as a milling cutter and you can see that seam, that join, disappear. That spot drill has really got its work cut out on this project. There you go, 
and I'm really happy that the pixel feature matches all the way around. And that's a nice shiny finish from the shell mill. So now it's back to the ripper and as you can see it really churns out some aluminium. And this is only going about 2000 RPM. And I think it was done about 2mm depth at a time and that can just be cleaned up with a shell mill afterwards. You can see how strong aluminium is, that's about 3mm holding up that big block. That's quite impressive and quite hard to snap off. Just a little tap to make sure it's square. This was my granddad's old dial indicator and I still use it to set up the squareness of all the parts. I don't know how old it is though, it's made in the USA and it says jeweled and it also says Model 1 on the back, if anyone has any ideas. But as you can see, that's nice and straight. And then it's a case of zeroing in the X and the Y axis to the corner. So this block here will actually form the two parts of the head. And I've done it in this way because you can machine out both parts at the same time. Where I rough cut it first with the with this ripping tool and finish off the edges with this polished end mill. So a bit of a test to make sure that the part will fit in and then finish off all the features. That ripping cutter really does save some time. I don't think I'm using it at its full capacity just yet. And this is only going at 2000 RPM where later on I should be able to get up to 4000 RPM. Because I'm going to replace the spindle motor with a brushless DC motor. So the same motors that are actually in the X and Y axis at the moment and it's all going to be timing belt driven as well but that's so I can do controlled machine tapping at a later date so one of the main reasons for doing a complicated project on this CNC machine was to see how well it's going to do with machining out all the parts for the MGF conversion where I've got a lot of parts to make and they've got to be as accurate as possible and that accuracy has to be repeatable So this is drilling out and counterboring in the hole for the magnet that will hold his head to the torso and this will be glued in. So this slot at the back and this feature is actually going to hold the Arduino Nano Every in position. So all the electronics will be mounted in the head. Now this is the most complicated bit of the head, which is actually producing an angle for the board to sit at because the board is slightly longer than the internal height. So I decided to put it at a bit of an angle, but that means I have to cut away using the eight millimeter bit first, 
and then move on to the three millimeter bit just to get those corners as small as possible. Then it is a case of cutting down the block and then separating the two halves. And I machined this off almost down to the vise. I won't bore you with that bit. Back to that ripper again. Although this time I decided to plunge the ripper in which actually saved a little bit of time, although it did cut into the part slightly. So now I could bolt it all together, clamp it in the vise, and then reduce each one of those sides down to the correct size. And last but not least, cut out the pixel feature. The first couple of passes on this I actually did quite light just to make sure that it wasn't going to bend or bow, but aluminium is actually quite resilient. It doesn't look like it on this camera but it was actually quite a good finish. So there you have it, one head that have got almost invisible seams and a hole in the back for the power cable for the Arduino. So now it's down to the electronics. So this is the Grove RGB module and here is the really small Nano Every. So the red cable is going to be connected to the VCC or 5 volts. Black cable is going to be the ground. So SCL being the yellow cable and SDA being the white cable. And these will provide all the data from the Arduino Nano Every to the Grove RGB LED matrix driver. So get them soldered up first. And in a bit I'll take that connector off the display just to save a little bit more space inside the head. So all I need from this USB cable is the power. So I'll just measure that with a multimeter while it's plugged into a USB port, just to make sure that black is negative and red is positive. Don't short it out, although most USB ports have actually got protection for that. And don't worry, I did unplug the USB cable before cutting it all up. So all the electronics are inside his head, and obviously with it being aluminium, there's a good possibility of a short circuit. So that's why I'm putting everything in heat shrink. But obviously with a 3D printed version, there'd be no need for that. Well, unless you're 3D printing the metal, of course. Then it's a case of connecting the red and black up to both the Arduino and the Grove display. Sorry about the camera, it went a bit blurry, I didn't even realise. I'm just putting a bit of Gorilla Tape in the back of this, just to make sure that there's no shorts. But also the Arduino Nano Every will actually be encased in some heat shrink. So it's just a case of giving it a test, making sure that all works. desoldering the connector to save some space inside the case. A 
little bit more heat shrink just keeps it all nice and neat. And as you can see at the top, there's a USB connector. So if you wanted to program this later on, all you'd have to do is unbolt the top of the head, plug in a USB cable and change the code. Or you could wire the USB cable directly into the board. and then soldering on all the connections in the same order that the connector was in. So it can be a little bit fiddly to uh, solder these on. But it's a good idea to test them afterwards, make sure you've got no shorts. And then I stuck a bit of clear Gorilla Tape on the back, just to make sure there's no shorts inside the case. Then on one of the inputs of the Arduino Nano Every, I connected up a reed switch. And this was in line with this resistor that I'm just putting on now. Just so the reed switch could pull down a voltage on one of the pins when a magnet passes it. So you could actually control some of the program with a magnet. So more heat shrink around the resistor. And I didn't want to put heat shrink around the reed switch. So I used some of that Gorilla Tape again and some double-sided tape to stick the reed switch into its head. And the good thing is, because it's made out of aluminium, it doesn't interfere with the reed switch. As you can see, it's very snug in there. You could probably also fit a Tinsy in there, which is another small microprocessor. And it's a nice tight fit for the RGB module. And there you have it, an 8x8 face or 64 pixels that you can configure yourself. So now it's just a case of putting the body together. And this is where you've got to get the magnets the right way around. So to make him on the Miller machine took around six weeks on and off, which is quite some time. I'm sure it'd be quicker if I made another one, but to be fair, it's probably easier just to 3D print them. So this one is gonna be a bespoke aluminium one, unless you fancy making one yourself. Although because it's all open source, you can make one yourself and modify it however you wish. So all the bolts on here are M3 hex heads, and they really hold the body well, and you can hardly see the seams. This camera going blur is quite annoying. I'll have to set it up better next time. Apologies for that. I think I need more light. I'm still learning. I think I'm gonna have to get a 3D printer next or even convert my milling machine to be a 3D printer. As you can see, he goes together and stays together quite well, where because of the light aluminium, you can actually just pick him up and he stays together. So there he is. You can use him as an ornament, a stop motion animation. You can have him as a night light or just a fun toy. And you can even take his head off and have it as a block of TNT. So if you type dev255 into Google, the first one up is normally my website 
And from there, you can actually scroll down, see Take Me to Steve, and you can click on that and it brings you into the project itself where you can click on the links and actually look at the files and download them to 3D print them. Also, I've put the full body on there as an STL file, just in case you've got a 3D printer that can accept that sort of size and you can print the whole body in one go. Also, I've got the Arduino sketch on there for controlling the Grove RGB module. All you have to do is go into the link, select the text at the top, select the text at the bottom, and then copy it all out. And then open up your Arduino IDE program, and then paste it in. So why not go and try and make one yourself? If you do decide to build one and want to share a picture, please go to my website, just email me a project picture and a short description and I'll put that on my webpage. I hope you've enjoyed this video, please do all the usual stuff with YouTube and hit the like and the subscribe and share it with anyone that might like to 3D print it and I hope to see your designs on my website. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.